Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Ruth Shelley, president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. As our banner says, Rotary opens opportunities to find solutions for today's challenges. Healing from the pandemic, recovery from the economic downturn, and peace building as we seek racial justice. Today, we turn to door number three as we hear from fellow Rotarian Peter Kyle about Rotary's history in global peace building. But first, let's welcome Rotarian Barol Yesalata for our reflection. Barol? Unmute it. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests. Um, in these difficult times, I thought I'd share with you uh, a saying from Nelson Mandela. No one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin or their background or their religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Parole. And of course, if any of you would like to give the reflection at an upcoming meeting, please let us know or fill out the link provided in the chat box. Now, welcome to any virtual guests and thank you for tuning into our weekly meeting. Please introduce yourself in the chat box where you'll find a link to guest registration. We're eager for you to fill it out so that we can stay in touch. And if you haven't noticed, it's September. I would like to extend a happy birthday to everyone with September birthdays. We'll alternate each week honoring birthdays and Rotary anniversaries for the month. Please note the names of these birthday people and reach out to one of them with a call or email since in-person celebrations continue to be limited. It's a good, a small way for us to stay connected. And now one of our favorite parts of the meeting, we're going to enter a virtual table talk. In a few minutes, all of us will disappear from here and then reappear in a virtual room with just a few other Rotarians. They'll be at random. And if you don't know each other, please introduce yourselves. A minute or so before you come back to this main meeting, you'll get a visual heads up. And although you never lack for things to discuss, may I suggest a topic for your breakout room? As we reach the six month anniversary of the coronavirus outbreak, please share with your fellow Rotarians how you feel Portland has changed during the past half year, for the better or for the worse. So here we go. Yeah. Hi guys, it's me again. And I uh, would like to remind you to register online and uh, for our golf event, event that is happening at the Langdon Farms uh, on a week from this Thursday, I believe it's the 10th, and would like to have you in there. Right now we have about uh, seven teams, the more the merrier, it's 125, and I hope you guys can make it. So the registration is online, and if you don't have a team, let me know, I can put you with a team. And if you have any question, just call me, text me, 503-939-6666. Hope you can make it. The more, the merrier. And yes, it will be COVID-friendly golf. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you, Niyad. Seven teams, that's impressive, but there's plenty of room for more. Now on to our program. After our speaker today is finished, if you'd like to ask Peter a question, Maria will moderate the Q&A through the chat box and she'll give you a few more instructions when we get closer to the time. Now, please welcome Reem Gunaim as today's chair of the day. Reem. Thank you, Ruth, um, and good to see everyone. So um, I'm so honored to introduce Peter. Um, and so briefly, this is what Peter uh, is all about. Peter Kyle is a dynamic global leader. He's the director of Rotary Zones 33 and 34, representing the Mid-Atlantic of Southern Eastern USA and Caribbean nations. 
Peter was the inaugural chair of Outward Bound International for six years until he was appointed Chairman Emeritus. Peter first came to the U.S. from New Zealand in 1973 to pursue postgraduate studies in law at the University of Virginia as a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholar. He practiced international law for several, several years before becoming a senior international attorney for the World Bank for 16 years. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Peter was instrumental in the revitalization of the republics through economic reform. Peter continued to support the economic development of over 80 nations through his work with the World Bank. Peter is now heavily involved with Rotary Peace Fellowship initiatives and has chaired both the Alumni Relations and Rotary Peace Centers committees. In addition, Peter has also served as an International Assembly trainer Council of Legislation Delegate, uh, Rotary International President's Representative, and WASRAG Board Member. For his dedication to service to Rotary, Peter has received the Global Alumni Service to Humanity Award, the Service Above Self Award, and the Citation of Marriott, Meritorious Service. Um, I had the honor of knowing Peter in the past years, and he's an exemplary world leader Peter is mission driven and laser focused on impact while being genuinely kind, humble, and charming. Welcome to our club, Peter. Thank you for um, joining us today. Well, thank you, Reem, and good afternoon, everybody. That was a very generous introduction, Reem. A lot of it I recognized, but some I didn't, and I appreciate your, your, kind, your kind comments. President Ruth, thank you also for the invitation to be with you today. I'm delighted to be here. I have a feeling that this is the second time I have visited the Rotary Club of Portland. Uh, I think the first time was in 1990, believe it or not. At that time, I was a Rotarian in New Zealand at the Rotary Club of Auckland, which at that time was a very large club, 300 members. And that year, the district governor decided to have a Rotary quiz contest. Clubs would compete against each other uh, it was a way to promote knowledge of Rotary. Half the questions were Rotary related, half were general knowledge. To cut a long story short, uh, I was a member of the winning team and the prize was a first class round trip air ticket on Canadian Pacific from Auckland, New Zealand to Portland, Oregon to attend the 1990 International Convention which was held in, in Portland. And some of you may, may have been there I, I know that we attended a Rotary Club in Portland. I can't swear that it was the Rotary Club of Portland. I suspect it probably was. Uh, so I'm claiming that it was. Uh, anyway, I'm delighted to be back with you today. I've been back to Portland several times. You live in a, uh, a beautiful part of the world. One of the impressions I had was that the, the scenery around the outskirts of Portland reminded me very much of New Zealand. Uh, that's, that's a plus. I do want to give a shout out to Al Jubitz. I don't think he's uh, on the call. Um, Al uh, is someone I've known for many years. Uh, and I regard Al in many ways as the father of the peace movement in Rotary. Uh, a great example of an individual uh, who had an idea, had a dream, and had the wherewithal to convert the dream into reality. And you're all familiar with Al, I'm sure that you know him very well. Um, he was responsible for founding uh, the Peace Rag, and it's a pleasure now to have Reem as the executive director. But his influence extends way beyond the Peace Rag. And as I say, um, it's a good example of how all over the world, it just takes one person with the, the passion and the energy and the enthusiasm and the strategic vision of someone like Al uh, to really make a difference in this world. So uh, please pass on my, my best wishes to, to Al. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about the, the history of Rotary from a peacemaking perspective. Uh, and as I hope I will persuade you, uh, Rotary has a very rich and long history of peace building. Peace is in our DNA. As you know, we started in 1905. We started slowly. 1910, there were still only 10 Rotary Clubs. 
1915 was a banner year because that was the year in which the Rotary Club of Portland uh, got underway. But the, the major issue in those early years of the last century was the, the prospect of war. People were very aware that the forces of nationalism were rising up in Europe. Uh, in 1914, at the International Convention in Houston, Texas, a resolution was passed to convene a, a peace conference, the first peace conference that Rotary would have had. In fact, uh, events superseded that. War broke out in 1914. Uh, and for the next four years, uh, Europe and then 1917, the United States were engaged in, in a very terrible war. After the end of the war in 1918, again, the focus of Rotary clubs all around the world was on peace. How can Rotary uh, be a force for peace? In 1921, at the International Convention in Edinburgh, Rotarians passed a resolution calling for uh, Rotarians to promote international understanding, goodwill and peace. International understanding, goodwill and peace. And those words have since become enshrined in the, the fourth element of the object of Rotary. And they are, of course, the basis of the Rotary Foundation. Next year, we will celebrate 100 years of promoting international understanding, goodwill and peace. In the 1920s and the 1930s, Rotary expanded quite rapidly. But again, at the end of the 30s, nationalism forces broke out. In 1939, the Second World War was declared. In 1940, the International Convention was held in Havana, Cuba, of all places. At that time, there were 58 Rotary Clubs in Cuba. Today, there are none, although we have to work on that. At that convention, Rotarians passed a resolution calling, amongst other things, for respect for human rights. That was the first time those words, respect for human rights, had entered into the international lexicon. And that became the basis for the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights signed in 1948, perhaps one of the most significant international documents signed in the last century. In 1942, a number of senior Rotarians met in London. They were concerned about the impact of the war on education, on scientific research, on cultural monuments and cultural traditions. And they passed a resolution which was the forerunner to the creation of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. In 1944, President Truman and Prime Minister Churchill decided that the time was right to start the process of developing an organization that would prohibit war for all time. Rotary was one of a very small number of organizations invited to send lawyers and other officials to work with officials from China, the Soviet Union, the United States and the United Kingdom to begin the process of drafting what would become the United Nations Charter. And the Charter was signed in, in June of 1945. 49 out of the 800 delegates at the Charter ceremony were Rotarians. When I, when I look back at the history of Rotary, and I've done a lot of reading in this regard, Rotary's influence worldwide was probably at its peak in the 30s and 40s. Prior to the Second World War, there really were no such thing as a non-governmental organization. Now we have thousands of NGOs, but before the war, this was, this was unknown. Rotary was by far the largest international non-government based organization. And at that time, the classification criteria were applied fairly strictly. To be a Rotarian, of course you had to be a male, but you also had to be the head of your company, the general manager, or the senior partner, or the chairman. Um, so it was a fairly prestigious, in fact, some might say almost elitist organization. But that had a, a positive impact in that when people of that level in, in society came together at international conventions, that was a very powerful force. And the, the decisions that were 
made and the influence that the organization had at that time uh, was out of all proportion to what you might otherwise have thought. So in 1945, the United Nations was chartered. In 1946, the officials at the UN decided it would be a great thing to develop an internship program. The idea being to bring young people from other parts of the world to New York to observe the workings of this new, this new body. Great idea, but no money. What did they do? They went to Rotary and Rotary gave them a grant of $18,000 to fund the first internship program at the United Nations. So that's really how we started our relationship with the UN. In the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the relationship really went into abeyance. This was the time of the Cold War. Uh, there was a focus on disarmament, peace polls, peace parks, uh, but not a lot of activity with the United Nations itself. In the mid 80s, we reconnected with the United Nations when we all partnered for the Global Eradication of Polio Initiative. We partnered with the World Health Organization, with UNICEF, and of course with CDC, and then a little bit later with the Gates Foundation, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, and many other partners. But it was in 1985 that we really re-engaged in a serious way with the United Nations. And we started to develop informal links with other bodies, other organs of the UN. So in 1991, the board decided to establish the Rotary Representative Network. This is the body that currently oversees Rotary's relationships with UN, UN bodies and international organizations. I mentioned UNICEF, UNESCO, UN Environment Program, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UN Commission on Women, UNDP, World Health Organization, FAO, and other international bodies the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Union, the Commonwealth of Nations, the Arab League, the African Union, and, and others. And Rotary has appointed Rotarian ambassadors with a little a as its representatives to these bodies in the cities in which they are based. So we have two people in Rome, two in Brussels, two in Paris, three in Geneva, two in London, four in New York, six in New York rather, four in Washington DC and other places, three in Nairobi, Addis Ababa. The main activity of this network was to promote Rotary Days at the UN. There was a time when the Rotary Day at the UN was the third most significant event on the Rotary calendar after the International Convention and the International Assembly. The board would typically meet, meet just before or just after the Rotary Day. Uh, nowadays, of course, other events have superseded. Uh, the Rotary Day is still a, an important event. Uh, three years ago, we had the Rotary Day in Geneva, which is the location for the European headquarters of the United Nations. Two years ago, we met in Nairobi, the African headquarters of the United Nations. I might just tell you a little story. Uh, I was part of the planning team for the Nairobi event. And I remember on the first occasion I went down there, I asked to meet with representatives of the United Nations Environment Program. The UN Environment Program is the environmental arm of the United Nations and it is based in Nairobi. So five young people came into the room, all young environmental activist looking people. Uh, unbeknown to us, it turned out that the team leader was a Rotary Peace Fellow from New Zealand. Doesn't get much better than that. The second person was a former Rotary Ambassadorial Scholar. The third person was the president of one of the local Rotary clubs. We had prepared our elevator speech. We didn't need it. They knew all about Rotary. And they came with a list of 25 environmental projects, which they thought might be of interest to clubs and districts around the world. That led to a meeting between President Barry Rasson and the chief executive of UN Environment, which led to a meeting between John Hugo, the chief executive of Rotary, and senior officials of UN Environment. And that led to a decision to establish a, a task force to prepare an environmental toolkit. Uh, this is a publication uh, which was presented at the Hamburg Convention last year. 
is a very professional uh, publication authored by staff at Evanston, staff at the UN Environment, and officials in Rotary's Environmental Sustainable Rotary Action Group. You can get it online. Uh, it's a very practical handbook on how to identify environmental projects, how to implement projects, how to monitor, how to evaluate. A very good uh, product of a collaboration between Rotary and a UN body. And we are in the process of developing more of these handbooks. I should mention that the, the network has around 32 representatives. Uh, the chair of that committee goes under the name of Dean, the Dean of the Rotary Representative Network. And I had the honor to be the Dean for the last two years. Uh, one of the best assignments in Rotary, uh, almost as good as being chair of the Rotary Peace Centers Committee. That was a wonderful assignment. Um, and we are hopeful of uh, having many more interactions with the United Nations, uh, which after all is a peace building organization. Last year, during Mark Maloney's year, uh, the plan was to have five presidential conferences to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the relationship between Rotary and the United Nations. The first was held in New York in November of last year. The second was to be held in, in Santiago, Chile at the end of January, but because of the riots and the protests at that time had to be canceled. Uh, the third was to be in Paris in uh, February. The fourth was to be in Rome in May. And the last one was to be in Hawaii at the International Convention. And the last three were canceled because of the pandemic. Uh, great shame because the, the events in Honolulu would have taken place on June the 5th, which is World Environment Day. And we had a gold ribbon panel of UN speakers uh, to speak. Uh, when we have the Rotary Day at the UN, typically we have the Secretary General of the United Nations or someone very senior. And that gives you an idea of the, of the pull that Rotary has. Rotary is uh, regarded as one of the senior, most respected civil society organizations in the world. We have a fantastic brand because of polio and other reasons. We have earned the, the trust and the respect of the international community. Uh, but it is very important that we continue to reach out to the international community. That gives us a seat at the table. Um, one of the reasons why the polio advocacy has been so, so well received is because we have senior Rotarians who every year go to governments to lobby for uh, the annual allocation every year. Uh, three very senior Rotarians go to the US Congress, uh, to both the Senate and to the House Appropriation Committees, uh, to lobby for a continuing allocation for polio. And every year we are successful. And notwithstanding the current administration's views on the World Health Organization, we are still optimistic uh, that Rotary will receive the, uh, the polio allocation at the same level as it has done in the past. The US government is far and away the largest contributor the polio eradication effort. And uh, we're hopeful that the US will want to maintain that position. So this year we're having Rotary Days in uh, Brussels, World Polio Day, uh, really as a way to express our gratitude to the countries of the European Union for the support that they have given to polio. Next February, we will have a Rotary Day in Geneva at the World Health Organization. The focus primarily will, will be on maternal and child health care, but I'm sure there'll be some focus on, on COVID-19 and some focus on polio. And other polio days are in the pipeline. In addition to the UN relationship, of course, as you know, in the late uh, 1900s, uh, we developed the Rotary Peace Centers program. The first cohort went in in 2002, and since then we've had uh, something like 1,400 graduates. And of course, as you know, Reem is one of our more distinguished uh, graduates. Um, and some of those peace fellows, and Reem is another good example, are now reaching positions of responsibility in governments, uh, in the, the World Bank. There are nine peace fellows in the World Bank. Uh, there are many peace fellows in the UN organization. So we're beginning to reap the dividends of that investment. Uh, and I'm excited about that. We've uh, opened a new center. Uh, it'll start up in January 
in Kampala, Uganda, and we hope to have two other uh, centres promoting the, the professional certificate by 2030. Uh, this, this year we've just completed the, the interviews for the next round of Peace Fellows. Once again, to my amazement, we are overloaded with applications. And these are people who've had a minimum three years post uh, bachelor degree uh, employment experience. So these are not people who can't decide what to do in life, so let's go back to university for another year. These are people who made a genuine commitment to be out in the, uh, the peace and conflict resolution community uh, for a significant period of time, but see the need to go back and refresh and, and uh, requalify their peace credentials. So we have some very, very impressive peace fellows, and you know about this because your club and your district has been heavily involved in the peace, uh, the peace centers program, and I commend you for that. In addition, we have partnered with the Institute for Economics and Peace, one of the primary drivers of uh, economic peace in the world. Um, we have a peace academy. We have many Rotarians say, what can I as an individual do to promote peace? And now you can, uh, we have peace courses. You can go online to the Rotary Learning Center. You can complete a course, take several hours, and you can become a duly certified Rotary Peace Builder. We have peace builder clubs. Many of you will know Mike Caruso, past district governor Mike Caruso from Portland, heavily involved in the peace builder peace club initiative, doing some fantastic work. Um, I mentioned the peace academy. We have peace symposia every three years. We bring a group of peace fellows together at the time of the international convention uh, to talk about and to promote the peace fellowship program. There are peace conferences galore. Uh, President uh, elect Sheikh Mehta will be having a peace conference at the Houston Convention in two years' time. Uh, and there are many other peace conferences, as you know, around the, the Rotary world. I, I often get asked, after polio, what next? And of course, the, the textbook answer is, we must focus on polio. Until we have got rid of polio, we mustn't even think about something else. Uh, of course, we have to think about something else because we know that we're going to soon eradicate polio. But my answer is I, I don't see Rotary becoming a, a maternal and child healthcare organization that's covered by the World Health Organization. I don't see us becoming a water and sanitation and, and hygiene organization. There are many other organizations that focus exclusively on WASH and have more resources than Rotary does. And the same goes for the other areas of focus. But in the area of peace, I really do think uh, there's a possibility for Rotary to carve out a niche for itself, uh, particularly in the peace and education area. As a director, uh, I'm rolling out a, an initiative in my zones, which I'm calling Rotary plus Youth plus Peace in Action, 100,000 young community peace builders. And the idea is to promote a whole range of peace events uh, in the 31 districts that make up the two zones on the east coast of the United States. Uh, I'm excited about that. I'm getting a lot of good positive feedback from the districts. Um, uh, so, as I said, there, there are many aspects of peace in, in Rotary's makeup. Uh, um, I think everything we do, in a sense, has a peace dimension, but we have a number of specific peace initiatives, and that's why I believe. Uh, Peace will always be a key objective of Rotary. The more we engage in peace building activities, the more we promote the peace rag. I had to get that in for Reams benefit. The more we promote the peace rag, the better. Uh, but engage in peace conferences, engage in uh, peace, uh, peace uh, and conflict resolution areas. Uh, I think the better we are. I'm, uh, I'm concerned that uh, the world and North America in particular has become a very divided society. And I really do think that Rotarians uh, have, a, have, a, have the capacity and even the responsibility to do what we can in our own way to bridge some of the divide, some of the, the partisanship. We need to engage more actively with law enforcement, with the faith community, with school superintendents, with civic leaders generally, uh, and promote more, not just as a service organization, but as a, a thought leader um, 
we have so much to contribute. We need to up our game and get more engaged. And I think uh, now that we have a female president in the pipeline at long last, now that we have the environment as an area of focus at long last, and now that we are so engaging with Rot Rotaract, uh, the stars are aligning in our favor. And I think the Zoom has enabled us to open up new opportunities in accordance with Holger Nark's Rotary Opens opportunities. Never would he have realized uh, how accurate that was. I'm, I've been going on, I'm a past district governor, I can talk for hours, but perhaps I've talked enough, President Ruth, and I'm happy to stop and ask any questions, answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Peter. Now I'll call on Maria, who will moderate our question and answer period. Maria, you already put instructions in the chat box, but would you please explain the process? Wonderful, thank you again, Peter. So as I shared in the chat box, please do raise your little blue hand, um, which you can find connected to your participant name, or you're also welcome to just message me in the chat saying, hey, I have a question. No need to type out your whole question. We'll call on you uh, to ask your question to start. And I'm actually gonna start today with our president, Ruth, who had a question for you, Peter, and then I'll follow going to Chris Achterman, who has his hand up. So Ruth, I'll go to you first. Well, Peter, as you were speaking, I was intrigued with the connection between peace building and polio eradication. And I was wondering if you could connect those dots and elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, I think uh, it started out as a public health issue, I think. Um, but as we got more involved, or as more and more countries became polio free, I think the focus became much more uh, polio plus. So not just polio, but other, other disease. We, we created an infrastructure, and you see it now very vividly in Pakistan and Afghanistan. In those countries, because of the, the, the instability, the turmoil, uh, what Rotary is doing is not only vaccinating children, but it is it is, it is creating the conditions for peaceful families, peaceful societies to come together and, and to, to live in a little more harmony. And we're seeing some evidence of that. We have some setbacks in Pakistan, we have setbacks in Afghanistan. This has not been a, a smooth road. But I think there are many examples where the, the, the road, and there are thousands of workers for polio, we have thousands of mainly females who, have, who are delivering the vaccinations, thousands who are um, transporting the vaccines from, the, um, from the, the supplies where they are kept, and thousands involved in surveillance and testing. There's a veritable army of polio workers. So this has become quite a, a force, uh, particularly in Pakistan and Afghanistan, the, the two countries where polio is still endemic. Um, so that, that I think has created uh, a force for good. Uh, we had a setback when that, that video that showed uh, the way we got, um, um, what was the name? I forgot the name, when we, Osama bin Laden mm -hmm. uh, in, in Pakistan. He was identified as a result of a polio worker going to his compound and that set us back. Uh, but leaving that aside, I think, uh, Polio and the polio workers are seen, and Rotary as 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 seen as a force for good in those countries, and that I think is generating peace. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'll go to Rotarian Chris Achterman. So, um, you, you know, you you've taught, you spoke about the Rotary Peace Scholars, and but one of the other groups that we you did not speak of, and that um, I don't know what Rotary International has done about tracing, but we have an incredible group of um, Rotary connected individuals and those people who have done Rotary Youth Exchanges, and that's brought out in the current Rotary Magazine. Um, what thoughts um, are given to tracing those people, contacting those people, and listing them in the uh, process of international relations in a more meaningful way? 
Right. No, very good question, Chris. So for many years, Rotary did not do a good job of keeping in contact uh, with ambassadorial scholars uh, and other alumni. That changed when the Peace Fellowship Program came along. Uh, we now are in contact on a regular basis with around 95% of all Peace Fellows. And we have spent a lot of time and money updating our uh, records on alumni. We changed the definition of alumni a few years ago to include Rotaractors, Interactors, RILA, Youth Exchange, Interact, and so on. The problem with those, uh, those programs is that those entities, the Rotaractors, I'll leave aside the Rotaractors, the Interactors, uh, Youth Exchange, RILA, uh, those names and those contact details are not entered into Rotary records. Uh, in the case of Rotaract, we are starting the process uh, of giving a Rotaractor a number uh, so that they can be entered into the Rotary address book. But unless clubs keep in touch individually with RILA students, Rotary Youth Exchange and others, um, it's, it's, it's hard to, to keep their addresses. These are people who are very mobile, uh, they're young, they have all sorts of different career aspirations. Um, so far, we haven't, we haven't been able to devise a way, to my knowledge, where we're able to keep in touch with Rotary Youth Exchange, except through individual contacts. Um, it's not a very satisfactory answer, Chris, but I think it's... <laughs> the moment. Thank you, Peter. Our next question is from Rotarian Leslie Brunker. Hello, Peter. Thank you uh, for being here. So I'm very involved in the Peace Builders Committee uh, at our club, and um, we're a very active committee. And as I'm sure you are aware, because you've been seeing the news of what's happening in Portland now, I want to ask what your thoughts are about how we as Peace Builders can affect a change in the war in our streets downtown every night. Any ideas? <laughs> well, uh, that's a, a tough question, but I'm reminded that three years ago, we had very serious riots in Baltimore. Baltimore is a tough city. Um, uh, there is one club in Baltimore, the Rotary Club of Baltimore, there was a time when it had 300 members, it's down to around 45, 48 members. Uh, but when the riots broke out, there are, are about eight or nine Rotary Clubs that surround Baltimore. And quite serious efforts were made by those clubs to form a kind of a task force or a committee uh, to really try and work with Baltimore city authorities law enforcement and so on. It, it worked for a while, but then it petered out. Um, unless you have people who are really committed to these initiatives, it, it's hard to sustain them. Um, I, I really do think, when I come back to what I said before, Rotary has such a well-regarded brand to some extent, we're regarded as a bunch of old white guys with white hair, uh, but that image is changing. And I said to Ruth, when we started out, when I looked on your website, I was struck by the youthfulness of the club's leadership team. And I think that, is, that has been reflected in many parts of America. There are, of course, there are old clubs and there are old folkies like me, but there are many, many more young, vibrant uh, leaders coming through the system uh, who are not uh, satisfied with the status quo. Uh, they, they feel deeply about their communities. They feel deeply, deeply about the place of America in the world. And they do want to find ways uh, to, to overcome these divides. I, I don't know the specifics of, of Portland, but I don't, and then Portland has a reputation as being a very peace oriented city. Uh, uh, you, you are more accepting of from what I read, I may be quite wrong, but you're more accepting 
of peaceful protest than perhaps other parts of the world. Maybe it has something to do with your coffee. You have great, I know it's great coffee in Portland. Um, so I don't know that that's a very compelling answer, Leslie, but I, I just think that uh, the more Rotary can reach out to, to civic leaders and offer their services using their vocational skills, their, their human skills, um, one by one, step by step, I, I think in the long run, uh, Rotary is a force for good. It's not a force for bad. Um, and I'd love to see uh, the clubs in and around Portland take the initiative because uh, you have that history of uh, accepting of protests. Uh, it's a more liberal part of the world than perhaps the Midwest and other parts of America. So perhaps there's more scope for making a difference. Again, this is a tough question. So. That's the best I can come up with for now. I Thank you, Peter. Oh, go ahead, Ruth. I was just going to share that that was it for, I am sorry, I have one more question, if that's okay, because he just came in. So I'm going to go to Rotarian Terry Goldman, if you could unmute yourself, and that'll be our final question for Peter today. Thank you, Maria. Peter, thank you for your, uh, your talk today. Just a question, since you've, you've uh, known so, you know so much about Rotary's history, and I appreciate hearing from you on that. Why did it take so Rotary so long to allow women to join our organization? <laughs> Another leading question. Well, I, I think it was just historic. Uh, it, it was what it was. Uh, Rotary is a male organized uh, society. Um, uh, women didn't start playing perhaps the same equal role of men until uh, long after the organization was established. Um, Sylvia Whitlock led the Rotary Club of Duarte that took the case of the Supreme Court in 1985. I'm sure you know the history as well as I do. An amazing lady. Um, it, it, it has taken Rotary a long time, but I think we're catching up quite fast. The, the percentage of female involvement in clubs is... Uh, uh, quite high in, um, in, in South America and uh, not so high in Europe, about average in America. I think we have around 28% in America. But now that we have a female president, we are convinced uh, that we're going to be overwhelmed with applications from females. And I think we're all excited about that. So maybe that's a, a note to end the, end the presentation on. Well, thank you, Peter. I'm excited too. And what great questions. I really appreciated your global perspective, Peter, your sweep of history. But then Leslie, you really brought it right back to Portland where peace building begins at home. Well, next week, our keynote speaker is to be determined. Please check our website and the newsletter to stay tuned. Once again, we'll be live via Zoom at noon on Tuesday. So as we depart, today I want to thank you, Barol, for your reflection. Thank you, Nihad, for leading up the golf tournament. I hope that next week we have not 17, but 10. Reem, we appreciate your speaker introduction. And once again, thank you, Peter, for sharing your thoughts. What a font of knowledge and memory you are. And I think that we need that sweep of history, especially when we're so concerned about the here and now to realize that peace building is a journey, a process, and we're all on it together. And so as we enter into a new Rotary Week, please join me in opening the doors of opportunity for healing, for recovery, and for peace building. As Rotarians, we are here to make our world healthier, more sustainable, and with justice for all. This meeting is adjourned.